Hello and welcome to CWU Live, our weekly show aimed at connecting with and beyond our members. Now those of you who've been watching know that the show so far has covered plenty of topics about postal, telecoms, financial services issues. But this one is going to be about something that's all too rare in Britain right now. MPs talking to trade union members about the issues that impact them. The Horizon scandal, the future of Royal Mail and BT and the impending general election. So many politicians have gone missing when it comes to representing working people, but we are glad to have one with us who stands up for CW members and workers in general constantly. Kate Osborne, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mike. As some of you might know, Kate is a Labour MP for Jarrow and one of the few proper friends of working people on Westminster's benches. She isn't a lifelong career politician. For years, she was a Royal Mail employee and has a vast amount of experience as an active trade unionist and justice campaigner. So Kate, if you don't mind, we're just gonna launch straight into the discussion with some questions we've got, yes. as well as some direct questions from members, which I know you'll look forward to discussing. Kate, can you tell us a little uh, a bit about your life before Parliament and how you ended up getting into Parliament? Yeah, okay, I mean, you kind of covered it there, really. I mean, I'm not and never have been a career politician. It was never my aim to end up there. I kind of almost ended up there by accident, if you like. I spent 25 years in Royal Mail uh, from uh, 94, right up until I was elected in 2019. And the majority of that time, uh, I was a trade union rep, uh, a Unite rep, probably for 20 years of that, uh, representing members in the Northeast Yorkshire and Humber region of Unite, uh, and representing that region on the Unite Executive Council. No, that's brilliant. Obviously, there's not a lot of people with uh, your sort of bo background in Parliament. How have you found it so far, uh, and how much did you have to adjust from your normal working life uh, to into that environment in Parliament? Um, so, I don't think anything can prepare you, actually, for what you find when you go in there. It, it really is a Westminster bubble. It's not like uh, any other workplace, I'm, I'm sure. And there are other people there, like me, that come from working class backgrounds and normal jobs, if you like, but there's an awful lot that aren't. So, um, yeah, I mean, four years in, I think I'm probably still adjusting in <laughs> some ways to some of the strange uh, ways that they have. Um, in terms of lifestyle, it kind of hits you quite hard. You're traveling, for me, my constituents 300 miles away. So for me, I'm traveling up and down mm -hmm the motorway a lot and that's kind of pretty heavy going at times but I suppose um, within my role uh, as a as a rep with Royal Mail Unite I used to travel a lot so in some ways it's it's you know the it's continuation the same. yeah of. absolutely you know I was representing people before I came into Parliament uh, both locally and nationally and now I'm representing people on a on a bigger platform but uh, but yeah no that's brilliant thank you very much very interesting uh, now I want to talk about your time in Parliament and particularly about something you've been becoming quite known for, which is campaigning for the Horizon scandal victims. Mm. Now it's all very well, the politicians like Rishi Sunak, they come in all guns blazing, uh, but you've been fighting for justice for ages. Uh, let's watch a clip of you raising it in Parliament. Mr Speaker, like many other sub postmasters, my constituent, Chris Head, was victim to the post office Horizon IT system yeah. scandal. Yeah. These errors have resulted in bankruptcy, imprisonment and even suicides. Yeah. Will the Prime Minister today assure Chris and others that he will commit to launching an independent inquiry? Yeah. Yeah. Campaigners have labelled the review into the post office as a whitewash and a betrayal and instead are calling for a full independent inquiry with statutory powers. This as agreed by the Prime Minister in response to my Prime Minister's question in February earlier this year. So will the Minister today confirm that statutory powers will be given to the inquiry, meaning that full accounts from former sub-postmasters will be heard as evidence and witnesses cross-examined to ensure proper justice is served? Uh, very hard hitting questions there. Um, can you tell us when you first heard about the cases? Yes, yeah, so um, I suppose from my background in Royal Mail and of course the post office, uh, I was aware of the scandal to some degree, maybe not in as much detail as we, we now have. Uh, but one of the first 
constituency uh, kind of cases, I suppose, that really caught my attention was the one from Chris. And he emailed me. So I was elected in December. It was January or February. He got in touch with me pr pretty much straight away to raise uh, his story, his struggle, uh, having been the youngest sub postmaster in the country at the time of uh, 18 he was when he took over uh, West Bolden post office. So he got in touch with me uh, and then I got the opportunity to ask the PMQ. So uh, when Boris Johnson agreed to the inquiry, first of all, I think nobody actually um, believed that he understood what I was talking about. He had no idea what he was agreeing to, uh, but he did. Uh, and of course that was what launched the inquiry. So Chris was the member, uh, your constituency member yeah. uh, at the time. So yeah. can you give us a little bit of detail on that case itself? So we, we, we'll learn a little bit more. Yeah, so uh, so as I say, he was the youngest sub postmaster. He, uh, he started off as a paper boy there and uh, he took it over at 18 and then like all the sub postmasters he was finding that at the end of the day it w the books weren't balancing and he was making inquiries as to what he needed to do with the with the horizon helpline uh, and ended up putting you know 100 quid 200 quid out of his teal out of his out of his own pocket in to the point where they turned around and said that he owed over £80,000. Um, now, they didn't prosecute him. He was one of the ones that they didn't prosecute. But he's been leading the fight for many years, not just for himself, but he's been one of the leading campaigners. He was one of the 555 mm -hmm. uh, w that originally took the, uh, took the case to, to court in 2019. So, yeah, so he's... Uh, He's, he's done such a brilliant job. He's, he's, say he's not just campaigned for himself, but he's been helping lots of other sub-postmasters fighting for justice, fighting for compensation, and t to clear their names and to expose uh, the, the whole scandal and the people that are behind it that still haven't really been exposed and they're still waiting for, that, for, that, for justice and for that to happen. Yeah, I can't imagine the stress and anxiety that yeah. Chris has been through. Um, I know that in 2020, one of the first things you did in Parliament was called for an independent inquiry into yeah. the uh, Horizon scandal. Can you tell us about that process and, and how that, that went? Yeah, well, I say it was the PMQ and uh, the Prime Minister at the time didn't uh, didn't have a, a clue, really, what I was asking for. And I, uh, I was sitting directly behind Jeremy Corbyn, who was the leader at the time, and he turned around to me and said, uh, kind of, you know, enjoy that moment because it's not often that the Prime Minister actually turns around and agrees to anything. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, we both said that we suspected that he didn't actually uh, understand exactly what, what he was agreeing to. I mean, we kind of imagined civil servants and, and other ministers maybe that did know, kind of all uh, kind of going into an Taking instant panic. <laughs> yeah. uh, but of course, the, um, they, did, they did deliver on it. Uh, of course, it wasn't just me. There were other MPs and, and other campaigners like Chris. Uh, and if anyone's seen the post office versus Mr Bates, you know... Yeah the campaign that they led before it, we got to that point. Yeah, and it's still still going on there, isn't yeah. it? Um, so how have you found the fallout? It must, I mean, it must sting knowing that people who have ignored the calls from the very start of it, from the likes of yourself, are now jumping on board and, you know, they're, 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 they're looking to jump into solving the injustice. How have your constituencies sort of judged that, that sort of aspect of it? Yeah, I think so, not just my constituents, but I think people throughout the country can see exactly what's happened here. You know, government ministers, the Prime Minister suggesting that they would be where they were had it not been for the ITV uh, uh, drama uh, is, is just ridiculous and transparent and everybody can see that that isn't the case because they've had years to uh, try and resolve this and they've done the complete opposite. Uh, they've um, They've protected the post office, they've uh, denied justice to the sub-postmasters, they've made them believe uh, that they were the only ones that were in the situation that they were in, which clearly we now know that there are literally hundreds, thousands of sub-postmasters that have all suffered this terrible injustice. So, look, 
I don't, uh, I don't mind who takes the credit in terms of the people that have actually put the work in, but to suggest that uh, the government have acted uh, as, as quickly or as much uh, as, as they're suggesting, of course, is a blatant uh, lie. And we're still now waiting for the legislation to come forward in terms of the convictions because they can't sort out the compensation mm. until those convictions have been dealt with. And we haven't had that bill brought to Parliament yet. Uh, I don't think it's even been drawn up. And the likelihood is it won't come forward before a general election. So, mm. uh, you know, uh, lot, we've still got words. a long way to go a on lot of this. Words. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of action still required. Yeah. Um, so from that, what, what can you tell, uh, what do you think the outcome of all this new interest in the case should be and what do you think real justice should and would look like? Um, so from talking to Chris and some of the other so sub-postmasters, there's a few things. I mean, uh, we talk, so so the cop we call it compensation when of course it isn't compensation, it's, it's really just giving them back the money that that they put in in the first place. It's trying to compensate them for some of the emotional distress, for their lack of reputation, for the lack of their business loss of earnings, in some people for losing their houses. I mean, I met uh, one sub postmaster, a guy called Bao. Uh, he was sectioned three times because his mental health was so poor. Uh, he, uh, uh, he, his father disowned him when he thought that he had taken from what was the family business his parents had it before him his mother then took it over after Bell was uh, was um, prosecuted and it wasn't until they then prosecuted his mother that oh. the family realized that, her, that he was innocent basically so I don't know how you compensate people for that so in terms of what justice looks like yes there needs to be financial uh, recompense for what they've lost uh, and compensation on top but what we also need is for people within Royal Mail uh, sorry post office within Fujitsu uh, and within the government to be held account uh, and you know that could quite easily include people being sent to jail mm -hmm. for what they've done uh, and so be it if that's you know what's deemed as being the right and fair punishment no, thank you for, your, for that. Um, moving on, Kate, wh what sort of thing would you say to any postmasters who might be watching out there and thinking about joining the CWU? Obviously, you know, we're, we're running the campaign within the, the wider CWU, but uh, I, I think it would be a good message if uh, you, you give your sort of opinion on that. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, first of all, it's Heart Unions Week. So I would say to everybody, regardless of who they are and what they do, uh, to join a union if you're not already in one but of course the CW a fantastic union uh, and in fact the rep uh, uh, who um, is I think the national rep for the CWU sub postmasters a guy called Sean Hudson mm -hmm. I don't know if you know Sean he actually now runs the post office uh, in West Bolden where oh. Chris ran in right, my constituency okay. so a he's a constituent <laughs> and in fact he was in parliament with me uh, just last week oh brilliant uh, and he's a great guy so yeah if you're um, it doesn't matter if you're already a member of a union if you're not a member of the CWU then join up no brilliant so yeah join the union absolutely um, let's move towards uh, Raw Mail a company you work for f uh, for a long time um, you were very supportive of our members during the dispute uh, let's watch a clip Uh, well, I think we have to remember that Royal Mail can still run uh, a profitable business. If they stopped giving so much money to their senior executives and their shareholders, they would have delivered a profit over uh, recent years. And what we're seeing now is Ofcom wading in, uh, paving the way for a reduction in our postal services when uh, Royal Mail have repeatedly asked for the USO to be reduced. The government, thankfully, have pushed back on that, and I, I hope they continue to do that. Consumers, businesses, uh, particularly our rural communities, our elderly uh, rely on it for uh, it, it's a vital service for so many people. So um, you know, I, I had a debate almost to the day in January last year about uh, the uh, future of Royal Mail and, and really focusing on the USO 
And as you say, there was cross-party consensus uh, that it's something that needs to remain in place. Um, I mean, but maybe it's a bit difficult because you're an MP, but how often do you send letters in the post? Uh, daily. I mean, a lot. I mean, is it MPs keeping the Royal Mail sing going single-handedly? <laughs> no, I think there's an awful lot of businesses. And, and as I say, people in rural uh, communities, we have people that are um, uh, digitally excluded, people that aren't able to send emails uh, and still rely on the, the postal service. And given, if you think there is a sort of a public good from having the six-day-a-week service, because of the people who rely on them, and, you know, Kevin Hollingrate was talking about, you know, magazines that come out, they want them delivered at the earliest possible opportunity. Was it a mistake putting the Royal Mail into private hand? Yeah, well, I think like uh, many of our services that have been privatised, what we see is them putting profit uh, over delivering a, a service to our communities. They... Royal Mail wouldn't be in the position that it's in now had it not been privatised, in my opinion. I I um, campaigned against privatisation, uh, and I would still like to see it brought back into public ownership. Really interesting points made there, Kate. Um, but moving on, um, I mean, what do you think the future is for Royal Mail? Um, and you've also been quite critical in the past of the, the leadership element of Royal Mail as well. Yeah, well, it's been a complete mess, hasn't it? I mean, it's still a complete, it's still a complete uh, mess. Um, I hope the Royal Mail has a strong future ahead. But as I said in that piece, there, you know, privatisation uh, has been uh, kind of I don't know. It, I was, it's been a disaster. We always knew that it wasn't going to work. When you start giving all your profits to your shareholders and you continue to be paying you know, your senior leaders uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds, uh, and then uh, you, you, you're gonna be in trouble, you know, and to, to be to be doing that at the same time as announcing that you're losing, what is it, a million a day, I don't know what the current uh, figure is, it just doesn't quite add up to me. Uh, absolutely essential and critical element to it, and you touched on it in the in the clip uh, previously, is the uh, universal service obligation. Mm. Um, what's your views on how that may look in the future and uh, and maintaining the what we call the USO, the universal service obligation? Yeah. So about a year ago, I had a debate on the future of Royal Mail, and that was very much focusing on the USO. Uh, we know that Royal Mail repeatedly asking uh, the government to reduce it down and Ofcom's report uh, is extremely disappointing that they're you know it seems to me like they're suggesting three days so we'll settle for five like that's a good deal which of course it isn't a good deal uh, we need to keep it uh, at six days for many reasons um, uh, including your members jobs of course mm -hmm. um, but we need it for our communities people rely on it I hope the government continue to push back um, because I think it's kind of the, it, it's almost the start of the end if they start mm -hmm. uh, messing about with that. So yeah, I hope the government continue to, to push back and that we maintain a six day service. Critical and essential for communities. Yeah. Um, BT, uh, you, you've also backed our members in the BT dispute uh, who took action last year. Mm. Um, you can see one of the tweets on the screen it says BT made 1.3 billion pounds profits, 750 million pounds to shareholders, 3.5 million to CEO. Workers get real terms pay cut and the food bank set up in the Northeast call centre. Corporate greed equals in work poverty. Solidarity to 40,000 CWBT open reach members on strike. This is an example of you always having the backs of working people. Why is that important to you? Because I, uh, maybe maybe not so much now by people, but I've always seen myself, uh, and I still do, I suppose, as an ordinary working class woman. Uh, and, you know, we see the corporates, uh, the balance of power is well out of sync, isn't it? We need to give power back to people. We need people to be able to know that they'll get paid a decent wage uh, when they go to work 
that, that, that they can pay their bills. And we see more and more BT and other big corporations taking billions of pounds uh, out of our economy whilst people are struggling, whilst people in work uh, as it said in my tweet, uh, go into f to food banks. You know, we also have teachers and nurses and firefighters, and it's just an absolute disgrace that our country is where it is now, when we're supposed to be one of the richest countries in the world. That leads us nicely uh, into the, the next section that we're going to touch on. Uh, you're a great friend of our General Secretary, Dave Ward. You're also a massive supporter of the New Deal for Workers, a uh, CW-led campaign. We caught up with Dave earlier, who had this to say. Hi, Kate. Just a brief message from me to you uh, and our members who are watching the show. I wish I could have been there chatting with you live, but unfortunately I'm out of meetings today. But I want to say to Kate and to all of our members listening, uh, Kate Osborne is, is one of the very best MPs you could ever wish to meet. She stands up for working people. Uh, she has supported the CWU on picket lines despite what leaders of the party might say. Kate's been out there on BT picket lines, post office, Royal Mail picket lines. Uh, and she's also supported us uh, in Parliament when there's been debates about the industries that our members work in. Uh, she is without doubt one of the huge advocates of the New Deal for working people. And I know you're going to discuss that on the show today, Kate. Uh, and I'm sure that the members will want to hear from you about what a difference that's going to make to their working lives and to, you know, the whole of the balance of power, really, in the world of work. So I'm interested to hear what you've got to say about that. And above all, Kate, I'm interested to continue to work with you and be assured the CW will continue to support you uh, at the next general election. And in these days where there's a lack of trust in politicians, uh, I would say to our members that you can really trust Kate Osborne She's a proper working class MP. Thanks very much, Kate. Look forward to chatting to you soon. Thanks, Dave. Um, some really nice, powerful oh, words from yeah, Dave lovely. there. Uh, leads us into the last sort of question of, of this section itself. Um, and it's a, it's a big one. Um, massive final question off the back of what Dave uh, said there. Why should CW members vote Labour in the forthcoming election? Yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, thanks to Dave, they're very kind words. I did have a chance to speak to him on the phone earlier today before I came in, um, so that's lovely. Why should people vote Labour? Well, look, I mean, first of all, we can't uh, possibly uh, have any more of this awful Tory government and the damage that they've done for, what, 14 years now. But Labour have... Uh, a fantastic offer in the New Deal. It's something that we desperately need, that working people uh, desperately need. Uh, things that we would expect a Labour government to, d to deliver uh, around banning fire and rehire and getting rid of zero hour contracts um, and making sure that people, working people, have rights from day one. They don't have to wait for the two year qualifying period before they can, you know, take a bad boss to a tribunal or uh, around you know paternity or maternity pay and what have you so uh, I think it's rebalancing the power giving that power back to working people uh, and you know given giving them uh, back rights that they that they should have they should have already of course but yeah I mean there's there's lots of reasons to that I could argue to vote Labour, but certainly for working people, the New Deal is is absolutely spot on and what we need. Excellent, thank you, Kate. Okay. Right, so um, thank you for all of that, very open and honest. Uh, now we move into the end of the show, uh, and it's a feature we call On The Spot, so I'm <laughs> gonna ask you a few questions, okay. um, just to get a little bit of a, more insight into you as, uh, as an individual, so, you ready? Yeah, go on. Yeah. So here we go, five questions. Um, if you was elected Prime Minister, what would be the first thing you would do? There's a big one to start with. Oh my word, that is a big one. What's the first thing I would do? Um, uh, repeal the trade union. Uh, That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good one yeah. for us. No, the the ones back right right back from Thatcher to the to the more recent ones. Repeal yeah. trade all, all the anti trade union legislation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Uh, second question. If you weren't in your current job, what would you be doing or what would you be? Um, in truth, I never saw myself coming out of Royal Mail, so I think if I hadn't been elected, I would still be there uh, full-time repping, uh, yeah, full-time trade union repping. I, I was very happy doing that. I sometimes wonder why I'm not still doing <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, um, Into the bear pit. Yeah, of, uh, but no, I, I, loved, I loved that job. I loved representing people and fighting for them. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about ever going back there, but, yeah, I would be quite happy if I was still doing well, we're, that. Well, we're happy with where you're at at the moment. So yeah, me it, too. It's a good thing for us. Um, right, the next one, Desert Island. What three items would you take with you to a desert island? Oh, um... Okay, so the first one has to be something music related. So, um, yeah, uh, Spotify or whatever, something that can play my music. Um, uh, what else? Probably uh, a Kindle, so I have something to read, uh, and a bottle of rum. A bottle of rum yeah. on the desert island, pirate ship. Yeah, that's got to be in it. <laughs> no, brilliant. Um, signature karaoke tune do you do, you oh do karaoke uh, if you ever heard me sing you wouldn't want to hear it a second <laughs> time i can tell you uh, i don't have one because i don't do it although i did recently go to a um a friend's uh, and we were doing take it in turns and i did um not on my own uh, heroes by david bowie that's a good song it's a very hard one I, but yeah. yeah it's not the easiest to no. do on a karaoke no. No. Um, no. nothing Don't. by David Bowie would be I won't be choosing that one again <laughs> but yeah. there you go but yeah heroes okay um, and now I like this bit uh, so you've got three people you have um, and then you have to choose which one you want to do the following with so I'm going to give you the three people and I'm going to give you the options of what you would do with them as well so the options are go for dinner Share a prison cell uh, and never see again. Yeah, so they're the three options. The three people are Serena Byman, England women's football manager, coach. Mike Ashley, the owner of Sports Direct, who I believe owns or did own a football club up, up yes, your way. He did. Uh, and someone you all know very well, uh, the ex-Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Oh my word. Well, it'd have to be dinner with Serena, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. um, uh, and I give us some reasons why, as um, well, you, you choose the three. Uh, okay, all right, let's 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 think of who with what then. Um, God, I wouldn't particularly want to see Boris Johnson or Mike Ashley again, to be honest with you, <laughs> or, or want to share a cell. Uh, I like the thought of Boris Johnson being in prison, so let's let's share a cell with Boris. Uh, and never see Mike Ashley again. Uh, not that I've ever met the man or ever want to meet the man, but uh, I think that would probably suit at least half of my constituents if he was never seen again. Um, mm, That's right. Uh, so yeah. go for dinner with Serena. Yeah, well, I think she'd be the best company. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I love football. So, yeah, we could yeah. have a good chat about football. And then share a prison cell with Boris Johnson. Yeah, just because I'd like the idea of him being in prison. I, I mean, <laughs> sharing a cell, I think he would have to be on the far side, you know, have him standing in the corner facing away from me, so I didn't have to look at him. Uh, but, uh, yeah. The uh, idea and then you'll never see Mike Ashley again. Yeah, no, he can just disappear. I'm, I am a bit torn between Mike and Boris swapping places, to be honest with you. Um, but, yeah, as long as I don't have to interact with either of them, that's fine. Yeah, I think that tells us that tells the story. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Kate Osborne. Uh, thank you for coming in. Appreciate your time. Uh, but all of you out there, have, uh, we have some brilliant new guests and episodes lined up for the coming weeks. Thank you for keeping on tuning in. Keep on sharing, discussion and telling your mates in the union about what we're trying to do here. Until next week, stick with your union. Thank you very much.